Good afternoon, teacher, the honorable panel, and fellow students. My name is Jenny Zhao from Basic Screen of Fairview International School, Johor, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Joining me as facilitator is Ms. Balzia, the homeroom teacher of Grade 6Y, Fairview International School, Johor. She will help with answering participants' questions during the webinar. First of all, thank you so much for investing your time with us today to further discuss how we can learn from our past crises to better handle the future crises that will come, where we will be talking about a topic that relates to our current situation, the pandemic. But before we dive into the topic, let me introduce you to the honorable panelists who will share their perspectives and expertise of the topic. Joining us today, Mr. Anthony Country Aguhero from Fairview International School, Johor, and Dr. Marvin Joseph Nair from KPJ Putri Specialist Hospital. Mr. Anthony is currently teaching individuals and society subject for the middle year students at Fairview International School, Johor. He has vast knowledge, especially involving social study. And today, he will be sharing his expertise on how pandemic relates with urbanization. On the other hand, Dr. Marvin is the experienced consultant orthopedic surgeon working at KPJ Putri Specialist Hospital in Johor. Welcome panelists. Members of the floor, I am pretty sure that all of you know what a pandemic is, but in case you're not aware, the pandemic is a disease that spreads to the whole wide world. Until now, our planet Earth have, has experienced a lot of pandemics. Do you remember the Black Death? perhaps the plague, Ebola and cholera. These are the types of pandemics that have struck human civilizations down as they rose. In one of our grade sixes units, we inquired about the ancient civilizations where we had explored how our ancestors dealt with pandemics back then without technology. In contrast, nowadays in every hospital, we have a crew of members tending to the sick patients and definitely a lot of scientific advancements. What about the past? 100 BC? How did they cope with pandemics and diseases like this? We never know. Pandemics have affected industries, people, countries, and every living creature around the world. Due to the global lockdown, nobody is allowed to work. Everyone can only stay at home. It may stop the spread of virus, but some low-income people might struggle and will die of starvation. To learn more about this issue, I leave it here until further discussion by our panelists. Now I will pass the floor to our first panelist, Mr. Anthony. Hi, Mr. Anthony. It's good to have you today on this beautiful afternoon. I wonder how urbanization is related to the spread of viruses. Would you help me to clear my doubts and perhaps the audiences too? Thank you, Jenny. Good afternoon, everyone. I am so honored to be considered as one of your panelists in this webinar. It always excites me to engage with young minds such as yourselves who are eager to learn and be wiser than yesterday. My name is uh, Mr. Anthony, and the title of my presentation this afternoon is Pandemics and Urbanization, Survey in History and How Urbanization is Part opportunities for diseases to spread. So to start, let me present to you on the next slide, the central idea that we will be exploring throughout this session. It, read, it reads, urbanization is part opportunities to spread diseases. Does it sound interesting? I hope it does. So um, for the next slide, before we proceed, I will be giving you the definition, the basic definition of what urbanization is. Urbanization is the increase in the proportion of people living in towns and cities. And on, on, the, on, the, on the next slide, we can, <clears throat> we learn that urbanization occurs because people move from rural areas to urban areas and that uh, rural areas are also converted into urban. Thus, we have the phenomenon of urbanization. Excuse me, Mr. Anthony, may I interrupt? Thank you. 
I have a question about your point a while ago when you mentioned people moving to the urban places. What is the reason for this? I understand that urban places are more developed, but are there any other reasons besides that? Well, people have different reasons, per different personal reasons why they migrate to urban areas. <clears throat> they would migrate temporarily or permanently. But as to why people go to urbanized areas, the basic reason would be because they want to experience whatever lifestyle these urban areas have to offer, like, say, business, entertainment, food, etc. So, yes. Um, I think I need to proceed. For the next slide, I am showing you um, an infographic on how urbanization uh, grew uh, over a period of time. In 1900s, you can see that there are only two out of 10. There are only two out of 10 people lived in ur urban areas. Until 20, uh, 2010, somewhere in 2010, there, uh, there's five out of every 10 people lived in urban area. And in 2050, it is projected that seven out of every 10 people will live in an urban area. So what does that mean? It means that there will be more areas in the world will, where people will stay compact and crowded in one place. And before we proceed to the next slide, let me ask you, what is the capital of Japan? Tokyo. Okay, that is correct. It's Tokyo. Let's proceed to the next slide. Well, interestingly, the most populated, the most populated city in the world is Tokyo. And as a matter of fact, it is the home of 37.28 million people. And on the next slide, we can see that the entire population of Tokyo is even bigger, on the next slide please, is even bigger than the entire population of Malaysia. Okay, let me emphasize that. The population of Tokyo, Tokyo itself, the capital city of Japan, is 37.28 million. While the entire the population of the of entire Malaysia, East and West Malaysia, would be just thirty two point three million. So, does it sound interesting? I hope it should. Next slide, please. So, uh, for this afternoon, my three points would be based on these three PYP concepts, which happen to be three Cs. Please remember this. Uh, we are about to cover the key concepts of causation, connection, and change. And on the next slide is the first point, which is about causation. Okay, point one about the key concept of causation. Let us Remember this question, uh, this guiding question, why is pandemic more serious in urban places? Well, COVID-19 started in the crowded but beautiful city of Wuhan, China. I've been there uh, three years ago during a Great Den expedition. This city has uh, this beautiful airport, the Tianhe International Airport, which can actually rival Changi Airport. But sad to say, we can assume that this airport became the gateway of the spread of infection. Our urban areas, as you can see in, 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 the, in the given photo, have high population density. Remember that phrase, population density. When people are packed tightly into urban areas, such as what you see in the photo right now, they come in contact more often and thus have more opportunities to spread this. It makes the reproduction larger and leads to larger infectious disease outbreaks in dense areas, such as in Wuhan. 
So on the next slide, um, we have to define what an urban area is. Well, basically it is a human settlement with a high population density and infrastructure of built environment. And technically, when we talk about uh, urban area or a city, that area must have at least, uh, I mean, must have a population between 100,000 to 300,000 people. For next slide, there are two things uh, considered in, in population density because a population density refers to the number of people per square kilometer. So there are th two things about population density. The size of the area, the size of the area, which are uh, usually uh, in uh, square kilometers, and the number of population staying in that particular area. Uh, for the next slide, I am showing you uh, the population density of the different areas in um, different states, actually, in, in Malaysia and also uh, the, the city country of Singapore. Uh, as, of, uh, as of recent data, uh, Sel the state of Selangor has uh, 688 people per square kilometer. You know what a uh, square kilometer is? Okay, just imagine uh, a square, and then for a uh, square has four sides, right? Four equal sides. And then each side is a uh, one, one kilometer, one one kilometer. So that is one square kilometer. And Trungano has 95, 95 people staying per square kilometer. Pera has two hundred eighty-three. While Singapore, as a city country, has eight thousand one hundred eight people living per square kilometer. <laughs> On the next slide. On the next slide, um, I am showing you just uh, the, the data uh, about Terengganu and, and Singapore. Uh, I'm showing you here the land area of Terengganu, uh, one of the states in Malaysia, in the, the, the country is Singapore. As of this time, uh, Terengganu has only has 1.24 million people, while Singapore has 5.85 million. But look at the land area. A has, 30, has only 13,000 square kilometers, while Singapore has just 725.5 square kilometers. So Singapore is way smaller than, than Trangano. But as you can see in the population, it has a way bigger than the population of Trangano. Why am I? Pointing this out with you because I want you to see the population density. Uh, Trungano has 95, Singapore has 8,108. And uh, we have these numbers because we have to divide the number of population. Uh, we have to divide the, the land area with the, uh, with the population, with the number of population, and that is the population density. Now, uh, for, for, the next, uh, for the next slide, uh, as, as, you can, as you can see, as you can see here, uh, I have included a, a, a column including the, the active cases of uh, COVID-19 uh, COVID in, COVID infection. In Silangor, it has a 1,431 active cases. Uh, in Trangano, there's 110, uh, Pera, 2053. Singapore has 16,841 active cases. As you can see, if, if you try to look closely, uh, the bigger the population density, the bigger the active cases. But uh, let me tell you that this is not, this is not entirely the, 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 it's not always the, it's not always correct. It's not always the, the truth. But uh, for, 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 for most part of the cases, the bigger the population, the more active cases. Wow, look at the figure. I'm surprised to see the connection between the population density with the number of active cases for the spreading of COVID-19. Let's poll in order for the audience to engage more in this discussion. You should see a poll through your screen shortly asking for your opinion on this query. In your opinion, do you think that Kuala Lumpur with a higher population density than Terengganu 
has more COVID-19 cases than Terengganu? Yes or no? You have 30 seconds to poll. Great, the poll result is out. Good to know that you're connecting your learning with real life experience. As you can see, Kuala Lumpur is a big city, so it has a complex density of population. Hence, this has resulted in an increasing number of the spreading of COVID-19. Back to Mr. Anthony. I wonder why pandemics are more serious in urban places. Uh, thank you, Je Jenny. Uh, to proceed, let's uh, have the next slide. As you can see in, in this infographic, uh, the state of Selangor, and including the, the Kuala Lumpur area, uh, as the most highly ur urbanized part of Malaysia, has the biggest number of active cases of COVID-19 infection. And I have read, um, I have read the, the reaction from one of you guys, uh, whether uh, the populate, population density is indeed related to active cases and uh, that you are, you, you are um, suspecting that there could be other ways of, of infection. Well, as I've said a while ago, yes, uh, the uh, population density is not the, is not the, only, is not the only factor to check uh, for, for the ra uh, rapid spread of, of infection. There are other there are other factors. There are other factors which uh, can be accounted for uh, the number of infections in a, in a certain place, okay? Um, so, but then as you can see here, um, the, the, the state of Selangor and then uh, KLR is as the most, uh, most highly urbanized area, <clears throat> get the, the most number of, of, in, of infections. Okay, uh, let, let's proceed to the next. Um, let's, um, next slide, please. So the basic assumption, um, this, uh, so the basic assumption, which is, again, I repeat, this is not, um, this is not always, this is not always true because there are other factors to consider. But then, uh, for the sake of this, for the sake of this uh, session, we have the basic assumption that the higher population density, the bigger the cases of infection. <clears throat> uh, let's revisit history uh, by uh, proceeding to the next slide. Uh, this is the depiction of a typhoid fever outbreak in in, Athen in Athens, Greece. Uh, at that time, next slide, please. At that time, Athens, Greece uh, was the New York City at that time. Uh, it's one of the busiest, most densely populated pl uh, places in, in Greece at that time. And, uh, but then around 430 BC, <clears throat> uh, Athens had 100,000 deaths from typhoid fever infections due to the fact that it spread in the metropolis of Athens. And also, yeah, another factor, and it's not just about it's not just about the population density at that time, and also the lack of necessary medical technology to diminish the spread of infection. Um, yeah, so that brings us again to the question: Why is pandemic more serious in urban places? Next slide, please. Let's check history on how urbanization came about. And <clears throat> and our takeaway for, for this for this point one is that when people are packed tightly into urban areas, they come in contact more often and thus have more opportunities to spread diseases. But on top of it, there are other outside factors. Okay, let's proceed. Yeah, for, <clears throat> I, this is point two, and it concerns about the key, con uh, the key concept of connection. And this, the guiding question is, how is urbanization 
connected to the spread of infections. Let's, let's start. So let's check history on how it came out. So as you can see on your screen, uh, this is the development of human settlement from nobodism to urbanization. Urbanism, natural system, village system, until we have the phenomenon of urbanization. Next slide. So at this point, in nomadism, next slide please. In nomadism, at this point, humans start, uh, you, humans uh, have, the way, have the way of living uh, that they travel from place to place. They hunt for food. They, do, they don't stay in one place. They don't have permanent house, houses. And the people during that time live far apart from one another. They hardly see each other in big groups until we have the pastoral system of living. And at this point, humans started to farm and domesticate animals. They built their own houses. Uh, they became sort of semi-permanent and they started living in smaller groups until such time. Next slide, please. Houses are grouped together and form a, a village. Bigger groups of people, at least 100 families. But then these villages are spread across the vast lands and most villages were very territorial. That they didn't allow people from outside to enter their space. And well, people at that time were not diplomatic. So, um, after that, we have the phenomenon of urbanization, that humans started building cities because of more, let me emphasize this, economic activities and trading. They have to set up bigger towns and cities as center of commerce and business. Yes, Jenny? Sorry, Mr. Anthony. I'm afraid I have another question for you. What has triggered the people in the past to change their way of life? from nomadism to pastoral to the village system. I'm sure there's something big that has caused the changes. Would you mind to share your thoughts on this? Um, smart question, Jenny. I believe that the next slide will offer us the, the answer. Next slide, please. Uh, I am showing you this photo while I'm answering your question. Well, humans are social beings. What does that mean? It is in our nature that we associate ourselves with other people, people outside our family, outside our community, outside our country. So there is no way that the world will stay in a nomadic way of living because we want to group ourselves. We want to do things together, right? We want to share everything with one another. And unfortunately and unintentionally, even sharing infections like okay and to proceed i am showing you uh, a bit of history it's all about the, the black death the black death happened uh, over 2000 years ago and it was likely spread by trading ships from asia across, across europe and in that period in history Urbanization in, in Europe was rapid. More cities were built for trading purposes. What's the result? Next slide, please. The result that in, Lon in London alone, more than 60% of its city population died. 60%. And 30 million deaths around Europe. And I can, we can't imagine how they buried their dead at that time. So let's revisit our guiding question. How is urbanization connected to the spread of infections? And we can have this takeaway before we proceed to, our, to my next point. The evolution of human settlements from nomadism to urbanization indeed facilitated the spread of infections. And let, let me point out again, uh, 
something about the, 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 black, the black Death. Uh, it spread across Europe because of, because of the trading activities happening at that time between Asia and Europe. Mr. Anthony, now that you have explained about the connection between urbanization and the spread of viruses, I'm eager to know how will pandemics change the urban landscape in our future? Well, then we shall proceed to my last point. And my last point is about the key concept of change. And the guiding question is, how is pandemic like COVID-19 changing the urban landscape? Well, I'm showing you on the next slide that some of the headlines in online news for the past weeks. Check for yourself. Everyone is expecting that, well, we will have a new way of living. We'll be practicing this uh, social distancing, implementing lockdowns and quarantines, and even accepting the new social expectation that everyone will be wearing masks in, pub in, in public. Now, let's check how we were turned upside down for the past weeks. Next slide, please. As you can see on, the, on this photo, this is the empty street of Wuhan, Hubei province, and it's at the center of the coronavirus outbreak. Before, before the outbreak, this was the, one of the busiest areas in Wuhan. But now, it's, it's a ghost town. Next slide, please. On the next slide, you can see a police uh, security robot drives on the high-speed railway station platform in uh, Shenzhen. And then this device, which patrols <clears throat> public places, warns people that they are not wearing masks. They are doing this after uh, the, the, the pandemic outbreak. And on the next slide, you can see old people, residents, selecting items on a community table filled with groceries for those in need. These are the changes that the world ha uh, has experienced after the, 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 the outbreak. Now, uh, how will COVID-19 affect urban planning? First one. The first one is we need to focus on access to more important. What are those important services? Next slide, please. Of course, better, better health facilities. Now we have realized that we need hospitals and medical facilities, more than five-star hotels. And interestingly, here in Malaysia, in, in Malaysia, the government has tapped the support of the hotel owners to use their beautiful hotels into quarantine centers because we need more healthcare facilities. Next slide, please. We have realized that we need quality education more than quality entertainment. It means we need more schools than shopping malls. We need curriculum such as IB framework, which includes international mindedness and real life connections of the things we learn inside the school. And here comes uh, the next one, better disaster information management. We have realized that we need this more than, you know, teaching you how to, how to do TikTok to go viral, okay? Next slide. And also we need better transport system. We need better transport system than having you know, this Disneyland here in Malaysia. Next. The second one is, sorry, uh, yeah, we need to survive first before we get those fun, uh, fun part. Next slide. And the second one is that we need affordable housing and public spaces. We should build houses before we build stadiums and sports arenas. We should build wider roads with lots of trees before we think about setting up any monument because that's what we need. Affordable housing and public spaces. Next, please. The third one would be integrated and uh, integrated green and blue spaces. When we say uh, green space, it means 
the trees, the, the plants and trees that we see around. Blue spaces would mean, well, the blue sky and then, and then, and then the, the waters around. Okay? We need to bring nature to the city. That's how we make our uh, city sustainable. And then the last one is, sorry. And the last point is better urban uh, planning, Be better urban rural planning. We always hear the buzzword urban planning, but we hardly talk about rural planning. We invest a lot of developing the cities while neglecting what's happening in the countryside. We make everything available in the cities. We beautify cities and excite people from, from the regions, from the uh, countryside to go to urban, to, urban and, to urban places and cities. But what's the result? Population explosion in cities. So it's time to make our countryside livable so that we don't need to crowd in urban places. And that brings me to my, one of my last points that the thought to ponder is the spread of COVID-19 in the world's most connected urban areas has raised issues about healthy population density. We're talking about population density. And we need to ask ourselves, have we become more urban? Because if there's one thing that this uh, COVID-19 has, has taught us, next slide, please. It's the wisdom to know that we need clean water more than sparkling water. Thank you very much. Wow, that was a very interesting presentation. I think I learned a lot about this topic within that fruitful 10 minutes. Amongst all, I am really astonished at the fact that urbanization contributes a lot to the spread of viruses. Now I understand why the government keeps reminding us to avoid crowded places. It makes sense to me now. So my dear friends, I hope we're able to see the connection between urban places to the spread of viruses. This is why many countries announced a control movement order or a total breakdown. This is part of the ways to handle crises by reducing the risk for viruses to spread among communities. COVID-19 spreads very easily and imagine how some people still get infected during the lockdown. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. It triggers my curiosity now and I wonder whether or not pandemics happened to in the past. Well, I'm pretty sure the next panelist will be able to answer my curiosity. Now let's move on to our second panelist, Dr. Marvin. Hello, Dr. Marvin. I hope you're well and good. Doctor, Mr. Anthony has shared his perspectives on how urbanization contributes to the spread of viruses. Now, as a medical practitioner, what will be your perspective on pandemics? Has anything like this happened in the past? But before we begin, I will recommend everyone to start posting your questions to be answered by our panelists at the end of the session. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Marvin. Hello there. Good evening to everyone. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank all the staff from Fairview International School and students for inviting me to be a panelist for this very pertinent topic that has actually affected every layer of our society uh, and it has actually spread worldwide. Uh, I'm Dr. Marvin Joseph Nair, uh, consultant at KPJ Putri Specialist Hospital in Johor Bahru. So I will be uh, speaking about the history of uh, pandemics in the past, present, and future. So just a brief description of how do we differentiate what is a pandemic and what is, what is a, a, an epidemic. In general, for the, for the interest of uh, making it simple, a pandemic is a disease process that is actually spread to a number of countries and even worldwide like what we are experiencing right now with the COVID-19 pandemic. And in the past, we had uh, other diseases such as the bubonic plague, uh, the cholera and influenza pandemic. Whereas when you look at uh, epidemics, they tend to be in a, in a, in, in a more localized, uh, localized 
distribution within a given population, like what happened with, with uh, the Ebola virus in the African subcontinent. So I will touch on this thing a little bit more in detail in the next slide. Yeah. As you can see here, an epidemic tends to occur when an infectious disease, uh, whether it's caused by a virus or bacteria, which tends to spread rapidly to many people within a short time within the localized area. For example, again, cholera, dengue, malaria. Uh, as we are all very familiar with the, the, the epidemic of dengue, which tends to occur uh, seasonally, even in Jobaru here. So as you can see, it actually starts off with one person and subsequently increases and affects a significant number of the population within a localized area. So as you can see, the, the first patient there is usually uh, technically identified as patient zero. So in terms of epidemiology and stud studies of uh, disease transmission, it's always important to identify patient zero and, and to, to actually look at how the disease was actually transmitted and uh, what can be done to prevent it. So as in the next slide, okay, a brief description of what, what, what cholera is. It's actually an infectious disease that, that causes severe watery diarrhea, which tends to cause uh, people to lose fluids and become dehydrated and might lead to death if it is untreated. And in this slide, you can actually see the effects of uh, overcrowding and urbanization as uh, was explained by Mr. Anthony. So if you look at the site carefully, you can see that the water source has been contaminated. And you can also correlate this with uh, what you have studied in your previous, uh, previous modules in the previous semester, in which, uh, which actual, actually shows that contamination of water sources has a lot of adverse effect with disease transmission occurring. In, in, in the case of cholera, the identified uh, bacterium was called Vibrio cholera. Next slide. Yeah, so this is just a very brief description of how the disease can be transmitted and the mode of transmission which causes epidemics and pandemics. If you look at it uh, carefully, there, there are about six uh, methods in which it can be transmitted. The first one being airborne. This is actually uh, transmitted from person to person uh, either by air or droplet infection. For example, in the case of MERS, flu, measles, and SARS, usually precipitated by coughing, sneezing, and contamination of uh, surfaces with droplet infection. And the other, the other two, the, other, the second method is uh, via blood and body fluids. For example, um, the Ebola virus and HIV infection. And the third is uh, waterborne diseases, which are actually transmitted by contaminated water, as, as we saw in the previous slide. Okay, as we come to the fourth one, this is the, this is the pertinent uh, thing that I think you all should, should remember, uh, the word zoonotic. Zoonotic is when a disease is actually transmitted between uh, animals to people, and either by direct or indirect contact. For example, um, the current COVID virus, uh, COVID-19 virus or coronavirus was actually um, transmitted between bats and subsequently ended up infecting humans. And in the case of MERS, it was from camels to humans. So zoonotic diseases tends to, tend to, tend to cause um, a complicated series of uh, disease process in which it's very difficult to identify why is it that the, the virus actually jumped from one species to another. And we'll, we'll discuss more about this in the next slides. The fifth one here is you have the vector-borne diseases in which the disease is actually transmitted by mosquitoes, fleas, 
ticks, etc. Like, for example, in the, the bubonic the bubonic plague or the Black Death, in which ticks transmitted the diseases throughout the Far East to Europe. And the last but not least is, of course, foodborne diseases, which can actually be transmitted by eating contaminated food, such as salmonella, causing salmonella, listeria, and hepatitis A. So uh, we'll touch more on this on the next slide here. So there are simple measures that we can actually um, we can actually employ to, to to make sure that we can reduce the risk of uh, of actually transmitting the disease from one person to another. The the first one being uh, to, to actually drink uh, water which has been bottled or that has been treated, and one simple way of actually um, providing safe drinking water is either by uh, boiling it and also by filtering the waters with um, commercially available filters. Food should also be thoroughly cooked to, pre to, to, to ensure that uh, the, the bacteria or any microbes that might be lingering the, the raw, raw materials are, are destroyed by heat. And individual veg vegetables and fruits should also be cleaned with uh, clean water before being served for consumption. So hand washing before preparation of uh, food is, is, is one of the very important um, things. So if a person is carrying microbes or even, even um, bacteria on the, on the hand, this can easily be transmitted to, to, to another person via the food which has been contaminated. Hence, the use of, of gloves and, and uh, sanitary methods of food preparation. So next slide, please. So let us now just take a brief walk into the past and have a look at what actually what are the different pandemics that affected uh, humanity throughout, throughout the different generations in the past? Um, one of the ma most famous uh, pandemics that occurred is also known as the bubonic plague, or black death. So the bubonic plague was actually named because the uh, majority of the patients who developed the, the symptoms developed uh, large bubbles, which they call buboes. Hence the name, the bubonic plague, and the, the color of the bubbles were actually black. So it was also named as the Black Death. And for a period between 1346 to 1352, this disease actually killed more than 50 million people all along the Silk Road, which was actually a very important trade route that that you guys might remember from your previous semester. So the the as you can see, with, with, with human development and develop, developing uh, trade routes and commerce and transfer of uh, technology, culture, and various innovations from east to the west, um, the, the downside of it was that it actually provided uh, a chain of uh, pathway for which diseases could be transmitted worldwide. So in the case of the black death or the bubonic plague, the, bac the bacteria, the, the microbiome that was identified was known as Yersinia pestis, and it got transmitted via rodents and subsequently to humans via ticks. So the Silk Road, which ran all the way from Far East to Europe, um, plus also the sea routes, uh, contributed significantly for the transmission of the bubonic plague. So let's see the next slide. In 1817, there was a, actually the first cholera pandemic, as we have seen in our previous slide, in which actually it was transmitted by um, contaminated water. So the initial pandemic in 1870 actually originated in Russia and was passed on to British soldiers who then uh, took it all along the Commonwealth countries to India, Asia, and also to other parts of Europe. Disease transmission is via 
infected water and, and sometime in in 1885, they were able to actually create a vaccine for cholera, at least then to reduce the number of cases and brought the curve of uh, infected patients and infected people down. This coupled with, of course, improved sanitization and uh, provision of uh, clean drinking water. As we look at the another pandemic that occurred sometime in the 1918, it's also known as the influenza pandemic, the H1, just caused by the H1N1 virus. In this pandemic, about 500 million people were inf infected worldwide and approximately caused 50 million of deaths. And it has been coined as the deadliest pandemic of the 20th century, which a very high mortality rate below five years, 20 to 40 and above 65 years is what we are actually looking at in the case of the COVID-19 minus the 20 to 40 age group. So what, how, how, did, how did humanity tend to, tend to manage pandemics in the past? This is something that is very, very interesting because if you look at, um, at some of the earlier pandemics like bubonic plague, uh, there was no real way of actually identifying what caused caused the, 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 the illness. Uh, microscopes were not really created and were not perfected up to the time of uh, Galileo, sometime in the early 17th century. Um, so the, 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 the main method in which uh, epidemiologists and uh, healthcare people at that time uh, tend to curb the disease was actually observing the whole disease process and observing the people who were contaminated or who, who got infected by this microbiome. So as far as the 14th century, so people already developed the basic ways of uh, actually curbing the transmission of diseases like what we are actually doing now, now in, with, with the lockdown. So this lockdown thing is nothing new. If you look back, in Italy during the, during the bubonic plague, they, they had already, um, already instituted simple measures like quarantining the, the sailors who came back from the Far East and the use of simple masks and even closure of borders. Uh, there was actually dedicated islands and places like what you see in the picture there, which were called Lazaretto in Italy, in which returning sailors were actually quarantined there to and were examined and to make sure that they did not actually have any of the symptoms of, of any diseases before they were returned to their families. So the next slide, please. So what can we learn from the, from the past pandemics is that actually the spread of microbes have kept pace with human development. And as Mr. Anthony actually touched in his uh, previous slides about urbanization, so urbanization and, and overcrowding tends to come hand in hand. In, in, in places like uh, Wuhan, in which they say that the virus actually originated, you could actually see that, uh, that, that, that animals and, and uh, food products were actually very close together. So that's how they actually postulated that, that the virus, which. Uh, which caused the COVID-19 made the jump from, from one species to another. So in urbanization, opening of trade routes like the Silk Road and, and various um, seafaring communities also helped spread the, the disease in the past. And in the past, without the, without the use of technology, without uh, having proper uh, healthcare systems and all, humans were very resilient. They were very um, innovative in trying to identify the cause of a disease process. And they all already had uh, instituted simple measures like quarantine, uh, use of masks, and disposal of infected um, uh, dead patients at that time so that uh, the disease could be actually brought in, brought under control. Next slide, please.
Uh, any questions, Jenny? No. No. Okay. So let's go on to what what is actually um, actually happening now, which is um, which is something that that has actually affected every layer of our society, right from the students to the workforce and to the elderly patients. So the novel coronavirus, which has actually caused the, this this current pandemic or the COVID-19 thing, which is uh, which takes its name from, from the Latin word corona, which means crown surrounded by spikes. Yeah? So novel means it's a new strain. This is actually to differentiate it from the previous uh, SARS virus. So the official name uh, is also known as severe acute respiratory syndrome uh, coronavirus 2. And the, WO, the simplified version of this is actually the COVID-19. COVID-19 takes its name from the coronavirus disease of 2019. So you get an abbreviation actually from, from the SARS COVID-2 to a simpler form, which is actually the coronavirus disease of 2019. So can you go on to the next slide? Yeah. So this shows us a brief morphology of the, of, of the coronavirus. As you can see, it's a very small, tiny microbe, smaller than a bacteria, which probably um, can only be visualized via electron microscope and not a conventional uh, light microscope. So you can see the morphology here. You have a, a crown of spikes surrounding a, a single strand of, of ribonucleic acid with a protein cover there. So this simple um, virus can actually be subclassified into th three different types at the present time. The COVID-19 virus type A actually originated from, from Wuhan and gradually mutated and spread to other parts of China. And you have the type C, which actually has spread to Singapore and Europe as well. Uh, next slide, please. So these are uh, the different types of coronaviruses in the past. And as you can see, most of them were just uh, uh, actually classified as zoonotic, zoonotic um, origin, which means that they jump from animals to people. Um, the initial one included uh, the SARS-CoV virus, which was transmitted from cats to human. And then you have the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome COVID virus, from camels to humans and the current COVID-19, which was transmitted from bats to humans. And some actually postulated that uh, pangolins may also have been involved in, in the whole disease transmission. So how, how does this virus actually get transmitted from human to human? And why is it that the numbers are significantly higher than, than, than other disease that uh, being transmitted either by body fluids or by bloodborne like HIV. This is because the virus is actually very easily transmitted through either aerosol, aerosol in, uh, droplets or to contact droplets. If you look at all, it's an aerosol thing. What what the main what is the main uh, method is either by by coughing, sneezing, which causes the droplets to actually spread from person to person, or the bigger droplet size, which tends to contaminate surfaces like tables, uh, maybe uh, doorknobs, handrails, uh, which can also then um, give rise to spread of the infection via contact. Next slide. So, uh, as you look at this slide, let's see the timeline for the for the occurrence of this pandemic here in, in Malaysia. So, in the late late uh, 2019, sometime in December, there was uh, a news. There was a cluster of uh, influenza-like illness, or commonly termed as ILI, ILI occurring in an in a area of uh, Wuhan in China. So at that time, they had not actually identified the virus. So as the disease tend to spike and progress, 
and the, the virus was then identified as the COVID virus, um, you could actually see a gradual increase in the number of cases day by day. The number of people getting infected became higher and higher. And you could also identify which were the people who were infected who became prone. Um, classically, the, those in the elderly age group with pre-existing heart condition, lung conditions, uh, maybe coexisting diabetes, were more prone to develop complications of uh, respiratory syndrome and sub subsequently cause death. So in January, it was actually identified as the novel coronavirus. And the first case of, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, the COVID-19 outside of China was, was actually identified sometime in 13 January and the subsequent spread in Malaysia, it was identified on the 4th of February, which the first case was, was identified, if I'm not mistaken, in the district of Selangor. Yeah. Excuse so me. So the next slide. Yeah. Excuse me, doctor. I have received an interesting question from Riku Watabi from Subang campus. He would like to know about the first virus that was spread in Malaysia. Would you mind sharing some facts about this? Yeah. Uh, way back in, uh, well, not too way back, it was actually somewhere around 1998 to 1999 in, in, in some small areas of uh, Negeri Sembilan and, and, uh, and also some areas of Pera in, in which the uh, pig farming or pig rearing um, business was going on. There was a group of, of people who actually fell very sick and developed uh, encephalitis, which uh, means actually inflammation of the brain. So initially, uh, officials uh, were thinking that it's actually a strain of Japanese encephalitis, but they actually went on to identify that the virus was actually uh, some different, uh, different it's of a different subgroup, and they coined the term Nipah virus. So during that time, uh, they, they found that the disease actually was transmitted by uh, fluid from the pigs to humans. So in this case, control of uh, the disease process um, required that most of the infected um, farm pigs were actually culled or killed so as to prevent further transmission. So if you look at our next slide, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, okay. So let's move on to our next slide. If you look at the pattern of, uh, of global outbreaks of coronavirus in the past, you can look at, um, at some of the figures here. Okay, sometime in between 2002 and 2004, you can see the SARS virus, which is actually a acronym for uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome. Yep, first reported in China, and then it spread on and affected eventually Singapore, which is our close neighbor here in Johor Bahru, resulting in about 8,000 infections and 700 over deaths. And the subsequent um, outbreaks of the MERS or Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome, which first was reported in Saudi Arabia, resulting in about 800 over deaths. And then we come to our current global pandemic, the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which uh, originated in the area of Wuhan in China and has actually now touched about more than 3 million infections. And the worst being in uh, the United States of America, which uh, accounts for about 1 million infected people and more than 60,000 deaths. So, so what actually happens when, when um, a person is uh, infected with the COVID-19 virus? So within exposure, the symptoms tends to develop over a period of either 2 to 14 days. And... Um, they present with fever, cough, sore throat, and eventually those who are really susceptible with pre-existing illnesses, they develop 
difficulty breathing. So this actually is very important as part of our screening process um, in which we now practice what is known as the new norm. I'm sure now if you go out to any place, you can see that your temperature is being checked and hand sanitization is, is an important, is important uh, method to prevent disease transmission. I don't know whether you can see this or not. So once the temperature has been checked, uh, they will give you a sticker for you to stick on, on yourself to see that you don't have fever. Yeah. So these are just simple measures that you can take to actually curb the spread of the disease. Uh, next slide. So how do we prevent simple measures to actually prevent uh, the transmission of the COVID-19? One of the easiest ways to actually practice uh, social distancing. Uh, avoid close contact with people who are actually symptomatic or even those who, who might not be symptomatic by, but might be carrying the virus. So a distance of, of one meter is required or about six feet. Yeah. So proper hand washing with, uh, with, with sanitizers and, and ensuring that when you cough or you blow your nose, there's always a, a tissue paper that you can use to cover to prevent that. And some people have actually advocated actually coughing into your elbow there so that you don't actually contaminate your hands and transmit it to, to, to the next person that you come in contact with. So again, remember to cover your nose and mouth when you cough and sneeze with the tissue and um, appropriate disposal of the tissue papers and to be... The, the other method, of course, is to avoid all non-essential travel to, to countries which are report, reporting very high cases of, of um, uh, the coronavirus infection. So that is why uh, closing of borders, which was practiced in the past, is also being practiced now. And we are now practicing social isolation by uh, instituting the, what is called as lockdown. So all these all this, uh, methods are actually trying to curb the, the spike in the cases that, that, and to actually flatten the curve uh, to, to reduce the spread of the infection. Please allow me to inquire about something, doctor. Yes. Thank you. Sure. As we can see now, most people are following these prevention measures, but there are still people getting infected in the end. Is this because what we're doing is not enough or is it because the virus is too strong? I think we have to look at this at, at both angles. The, the, the COVID virus is peculiar in the sense that it has got a very high infectivity rate. So whatever measures that we do now is actually to mitigate the effect of the virus. That means to reduce the, the, the virus transmission because it's, it's highly infective. Uh, when you say whether the virus is very strong, uh, I would correlate that with the number of deaths. If you look at it, the number of deaths from the coronavirus is, although the numbers are a bit higher, but if you compare the percentage, it's, it's actually less than those who are infected with either MERS or even the SARS virus. So, I think the infectivity of the COVID virus is the main cause for it to be transmitted. Yes, hope that answers your question. Thank you. So shall we move on to the next slide? Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now I will have the audience's opinion on this, on an interesting topic is about who should wear the mask. So my friends, who do you think should wear a mask in this current situation of COVID-19? Is it only the frontliners or is it those who have symptoms or should it be everyone? You will see a poll flash on your screen.
Okay, so the poll result is out. One person thinks that only the frontliner frontliner should wear the mask, while eight percent thinks that those who have symptoms should wear the mask, and everyone, almost everyone, ninety-one percent of people think that everyone should wear a mask. Well, what do you think, Dr. Marvin? Which one is the correct answer? Yes, as you can see, I'm wearing my mask right now. So uh, the WHO has actually come out with a very simple um, recommendation for, for uh, when to use a mask. Okay. So for healthy people who are in close contact with suspected cases of COVID virus infection, then yes, they do need to wear a mask. And if you are symptomatic, then you should wear a mask, even though you might not be having the COVID virus, but it's also to prevent any transmission via coughing, sneezing, okay? And masks should also not only just be used solitarily, you should also use it together with a combination of social distancing and hand cleaning uh, to actually prevent the disease transmission. Another important thing, I don't know whether you can actually look at the video, is the way in which you wear the mask. If you just wear the mask and hope that you know you, the person doesn't get the COVID virus, it's actually very wrong. Because simple face mask like this still has actually a small area in which you can get the aerosol to actually enter into the, into the, the, the breathing area on the sides here. So social distancing is very important when we, when we look at it. So you need to actually take all into consideration, wearing a mask, social distancing, and also stay at home, be on the safe side. <laughs> Next slide, please. Sorry to interrupt, doctor. I received another question from Nicholas Lau from FISJB. He would like to know if there's any cure for this COVID-19. Ah, hello there, Nicholas. Yep, this is a very important question. When we talk about cure for, for the COVID-19 virus, up to now, there's no antiviral uh, drugs that have been confirmed to actually um, control or maybe eradicate the the COVID-19 virus, none have come very effective in actually um, uh, treating COVID-19 viral infections. Although there are some clinical trials and, and small group of patients who are being tested, but uh, up to now, there's still no antiviral medication. Uh, there's no specific uh, vaccine which has been developed yet. So the mainstay, as when we when we talk about maybe cure, is actually uh, as follow the what has been said in the past that prevention is better than the cure. So in the case of COVID nineteen, is is prevention, prevention, prevention. That is again social distancing, quarantine, practicing uh, good uh, hand cleaning, and avoiding crowded places so that we can flatten the curve and, and actually help mitigate the effects of, of the COVID virus. So what are the lessons that we can, can learn from the present pandemic is that microbes like the COVID-19 viruses are actually micro predators, very tiny little organisms which you can't even see on a regular microscope. You need a very high powered electron microscope to study these viruses, but they can wreak havoc within um, the global population in terms of uh, health, the, the social uh, practices, uh, the economy. And uh, this is what is going to shape the next 10 years of human development. We're going to see some things which are now being coined as the new norm in which uh, people tend to avoid crowded places and to actually uh, avoid non-essential meetings and 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 even in 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 this has been uh, applicable to students i'm sure right now the students of fairview have actually been thrust into e-learning so much so they have uh, as i've seen 
they have become very well versed with um, with webinars and and e-learning from home itself. So, as we have learned from the past and the present, what can we expect in the future is um, to actually learn the importance of identifying the source of infection and how fast that we can we can rapidly respond to the source of infection to to curb the spread by using very simple simple methods that was developed maybe hundreds of years ago like like quarantine closing of borders and and various other methods in the future also there will be evaluation of effective treatment protocols and development of vaccines and probably sharing of knowledge between different uh, different parts of the world in which we can actually compare and find out what are the what are the different uh, different ways to curb uh, disease transmission so in the next slide this the, the term that has been coined is actually known as collective intelligence so for so in a very long time, if you have, if you look at, at what has been going on with, with, with humanity, is that we've been preoccupied with, with other things like wars, civil wars, wars between countries, you know, people fighting and all that. But now we have a common common enemy. Whether you are from the east, the west, the north or south, humanity has actually come together to fight a common enemy, which is the COVID-19 virus. And people have actually termed, coined a term called collective intelligence in different ways in which we can actually help each other to, to, to learn more about the disease process and how to combat it. So there are various platforms that have actually come into play um, to actually help us with this collective intelligence. If you look at, uh, at, a, at a company called blue.com, uh, they actually uh, postulated earlier to their to their clients that um, that the Wuhan virus will be wreaking havoc. That's roughly about nine days before the WHO uh, identified it. And in Singapore, they're using GPS monitoring to track patients and to identify clusters of patients who are affected, uh, as well as other methods like social media mining and and different different open source test kits to identify rapid rapid testing of patients and of course like i said before the sharing of knowledge between various healthcare professionals and epidemiologists who are actually studying the disease so can you go on to the next slide thank you doctor Hmm, I learned a new term today, zoonotic. To recall, zoonotic means the viruses jump from animal to people and later from people to people. It's a goosebump, don't you think? How interesting to know more about the past pandemics as early as in 1346. I really enjoy how Dr. Marvin has walked us through from the past until now. I hope you are also able to follow the pandemic's timeline and reflect on the importance of preparedness in facing crises. One thing for sure, it's an individual's responsibility to maintain a healthy lifestyle and be cooperative to the authorities, especially during this difficult time. It takes the whole community to abide the government order to help in fighting this pandemic. I certainly hope all of you enjoyed his, this presentation as well as I did. Thank you once again, Dr. Marvin. All right, it's time to help you clear your doubts by directing your questions to our panelists today. The first question is from Ceres from Penang campus, and the question goes like this. Even with urbanization, a pandemic is still happening. How can we prevent a crisis like this in the future? Or is what we're doing now the best solution we have? Let's ask Mr. Anthony's help to answer this question. Okay. Um... Thank you for that question. In my opinion, uh, we cannot actually prevent any pandemic from happening again. So long as people engage and commune with one another, spread of infection is always a possibility. 
uh, we have gone a long history of pandemics. We have SARS, MERS, um, cholera, flu pandemic, Black Death. But what can we do about it? We need to be wiser. Or we need to be more capable of addressing when pandemic happens. We should have the necessary systems in place, hospitals and medical centers, protocols on how to handle every possible worst case scenario, and of course, the relevant workforce and frontliners to deal with the crisis. So this time, we have to be this prepared. I hope that answers the, the question. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. The second question is asked by Jiaxin from JB Campus. How can a doctor be able to make sure that the vaccines created for the virus are effective? Are there any inventions to make sure that the vaccines are actually effective? I think you will be the right person to answer this, Dr. Marvin. What do you think? Yes, that's a very interesting question. If, if you look at the, um, the development of vaccines, yeah, uh, usually there are several stages. First is to actually identify, um, the, identify the, the, the antibodies that might be uh, produced by, by the virus and subsequently engineer a vaccine, which can be administered to humans. But before human trials, there's usually a period in which the vaccine is actually uh, um, tried, tried on, on uh, animals before you go on to, once you, you have ensured that it's relatively safe, then you go on to human trials with a small group of people and then you study the outcome to see whether they have, the, they have any uh, side effects and whether the, the benefit of the vaccine actually outweighs the risk. Yeah, so that is how people actually identify a vaccine which is safe, that the benefits of the vaccine should always outweigh the, the risk involved. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Marvin. Now we will move on to the third question from Penang Campus, Shatana. When people from rural areas go to urban areas, Will those people feel mentally ill or bullied because people who live in rural areas aren't up to the latest trends or not as technological advanced? Well, this question fits in well to Mr. Anthony's expertise. What do you think, Mr. Anthony? Uh, this is not too relevant to my topic, but I have to answer that question as a social studies teacher. Uh, well, it's normal for, for a person to feel uneasy when he or she is placed in, a, in an odd situation like having a person from the countryside to adapt to the urban lifestyle. I myself have experienced that before. Uh, I was then a boy from the rural and had to figure out how I would step on the escalator without losing my balance. So for an urban people like you, it was not a problem. But for me, it was always terrifying back then to use that escalator. But it was a lesson learned, it was a lesson to be learned by both sides. Well, as for me, I have to get adapted to the technology and for the urban people to be more helpful in understanding uh, for people who struggle to adjust in the urban lifestyle. And I would like to add hashtag no to bullying. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. The next question is from Li Jun from the JB campus. Will the crises in the past actually affect the crisis happening in the present? Can you help with this question, Mr. Anthony? Oh, okay. Uh, the pandemic crisis in the past can affect the crisis happening in the present, uh, especially on how we approach and deal with the, pro uh, uh, the problem, say uh, the COVID-19 infection. Um, let me give you one very specific example. Uh, I think this has been uh, briefly discussed or mentioned by Dr. Marvin. That the 
actually began during uh, the 14th century uh, in an effort of in an effort to protect uh, those coastal cities uh, especially along the Mediterranean regions uh, plague epidemics at that time. Uh, ships arriving from infected ports were required to sit at Angkor for at least 40 days before landing. So yes, uh, we can uh, use all the insights, all the, ex uh, all the experiences uh, of the past uh, pandemics and then you know uh, use these methods and insights to our current situation. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. Let's proceed to the next question from Aditya in JB campus. Here goes the question. The animal that transmits the COVID-19 is the bat, but how does the bat survive the COVID-19? I'm pretty sure Dr. Marvin has the answer to this question. That's, that's actually a very interesting question because if you look, look at the, the, uh, the, the animal itself from which the virus uh, originated, uh, scientists have actually extracted the DNA from this, uh, these animals and actually they found that their genetic material actually produces certain chemical compounds that can actually create an immunity for them against the virus so that they don't, don't become susceptible to the symptoms. Hence, they're just carriers of the, of, the, of the virus and they don't really uh, succumb to the symptoms and don't develop any complications. So it's basically a, a, an immunity which is inborn within these animals. Uh, the, what we see in the, in the human model is actually it actually reflects in the human model. If you look at the 1918 pandemic, the flu pandemic, at that time, millions of people passed away. But over time, humanity tend to develop immunity towards the H1N1, and not everybody is susceptible. So if you look at it now, H1N1 infections are coined as, um, is coined as a seasonal flu. So those who are actually traveling to cold countries, those who are elderly patients, you can actually take a vaccine for about a year and that gives them the immunity. But a large population, a large number of the population actually have actually developed uh, immunity towards the H1N1 infection. So the same thing goes for, for these animals who are actually carrying the COVID virus. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Anthony and Dr. Marvin for helping the audience to clear their doubts. Dear friends, thank you too for the meaningful questions. I hope our panelists have helped you to get the answer to your curious mind. Your participation is okay, truly appreciated. Sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I really appreciate all the questions asked in the, the Zoom chat. And I just want, for the last time, I just want to address one of the questions raised, which was, uh, it's about uh, an observation of why uh, there's a pandemic every for for every century for a uh, century. Uh, let me address that. Uh, yes, it's 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 true, and but then uh, we can call it um, serendipity or coincidence. But we need to take note that in between in between those years, there were also other pandemics happened in the world. Okay, let me give you an example. Um, uh, the H2N, the H2N2 um, pandemic, which was in 1957 to 1958, the H3N2 flu virus in 1968. So yeah, every uh, we experienced pandemic uh, every uh, century, but then in between there were also pandemics uh, happened in our history. Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Anthony. But anyways, back to where I was. Your participations are truly appreciated and it is time to end the session. But before that, allow me to wrap up the session with three major points that we have obtained from the panelists. First, we were able to see the connection between urbanization and the spread of viruses. There are many factors that contributed to this and one of the most obvious factors 
is the complexity of the urban area. The more people living in the area, the more risk that the viruses will spread. This, from a medical point of view, has helped viruses to be easily transferred from one person to another. Another key point that we obtained today is the existence of pandemics since the past civilizations. Sadly, a huge number of people died in the past when pandemics struck their place due to the lack of scientific advancements, where vaccines were not yet discovered at that point of time. With today's advancement, scientists have the better chance of helping to fight over global crises, especially involving the spread of viruses or diseases. The third point that is also the most crucial point in helping countries to face future crises is proper urban planning. The designated authorities should invest more on proper planning, not only to reduce the risk, but also to be prepared for future pandemics. I couldn't agree more on Benjamin Franklin when he quoted, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. In conclusion, pandemics not only change the urban landscape, but it will also change people's lifestyle, business trends, education landscape, the way you and me use the technologies for our school tasks, and many more, just to name a few. We have been impacted by the current pandemic by not being able to attend school as usual, but we also understood that the MCO is part of the government action to protect us all. We should be grateful that our government and frontliners are capable of handling these crises and have become an example to the Asian countries. This is not the first pandemic, and we have learned a lot from the past. It reminds me of Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous quote, we are not the makers of history, we are made by history. From the three main points that we have abstracted from this session, what can you suggest to the design unit authorities in order to be prepared for future pandemics? As sixth graders, surely we can't contribute money or the big things, but there must be something that we can develop, create, or design. Don't you think so? As part of taking action, I hope you can work collaboratively in your exhibition group to think of some actions in order to contribute to this topic. Dear fellow friends, to spice up the session, I would like to throw a poll to see if we have the same opinion about the topic. Will the current pandemic affect our future lifestyle? What do you think? Yes or no? Think carefully before you give out your poll. So the results are out, and quite a lot of people agree with me. 89% of the people say yes, and 11% of the people say no. So for my own opinion, I think that it will affect our future lifestyle because people will be more anxious if this will happen again. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, a big fat thank you to all our panelists. Mr. Anthony and Dr. Martin, and also all the audiences for joining us today in this lovely afternoon. I, Jenny Dow, signing off now. Thank you very much. All right, students and uh, panelists and moderator, thank you so much for participating today. And I hope that you have uh, learned something uh, out of this. And um, I do share your, yeah, I've shared the, uh, link the same link is the same uh, uh, feedback link 
You just need to choose for webinar two now and then give your feedback for today's webinar. We'd like to hear from you. Um, and we will see you again uh, on the 12th of uh, May for the third webinar for uh, the series three. Okay, on a different topic while still looking at uh, pandemic as a key uh, overarching team. All right, so I hope to see you there. Be more prepared and um, we will uh, be prepared. You will have the link to you uh, before the session. Uh, please check your email. Uh, at the same time, uh, it will be on the 12th uh, June, on the 12th of May, it's so a Tuesday, at the same time. Uh, I will update the timing, our, our webinar timing will be 2.30 to 4, so that we have enough time for Q&A and uh, panelist information. All right. Um, again, I would like to thank you again, uh, Dr. Marvin, thank you for your time, for being here, uh, taking awesome. time off work, and Mr. Anthony, same to you for helping us and preparing for today's session. All right, and Ms. Fauzia, for your time and uh, effort at the same time. Thank you, Jenny, for moderating the session today. All right, um, that will be the end. Um, I guess we will, I will still leave the session about five minutes to be on, as there are some questions uh, asked by the uh, students uh, that we might want to answer. So um, if there's anything that, uh, mm -hmm that you think Dr. Marine or Ms. Anthony that you would like to just address quickly, you can just say and I'll just uh, go about it. There are about, I think about another 11 questions that they have, uh, specific questions. Um, maybe Dr. Marvin, uh, why, uh, why alcohol can prevent you from getting the virus? Uh, maybe we can help with that. I think that's, uh, when, it's, when it's saying alcohol, I think it's just when you're using it as a sanitizer. Uh, <laughs> And not to be ingested like what people people think. I think yeah, that's how it actually prevents it. Because most of the alcohol-based uh, sanitizers tend to cause the the virus to actually disintegrate. Yeah. All right. So well, most of the equations are very similar. Okay. And uh, we will look into the question and then we will get back the answer to the student. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating and a uh, good day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank just you. don't forget to uh, submit the feedback form. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to, all, to all the students at Fairview, great job. Hang in there. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you.